so um, as far as sort of uh, breaking in as, as far as a writer, I th it's that was 15 years ago, but the, the things that I think are still important are write as much as you can, and then at some point probably, if not move to Los Angeles or New York, move to Los Angeles or New York, and then just try to, um, nobody knows anyone when they're born, you have to go and out there and meet them. So even if you don't have any connections, uh, it's it's easier to make them in Los Angeles. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any I really good. quickly was that the commercials looked okay, and they were fine, you know, but ultimately when you're out there and you're in the world of people making you know, brilliant short films every day, you know, features and, and all kinds of, you're in the, the, the competition was immense, and I realized, well, I can either keep trying to do this with my pizza commercials, I can go make a short, or I can try and get into the business as an employee. Never mind what I think about myself as an artist and what I think my capabilities are. What if I get into the business as an employee and meet people? And then maybe later, down the road, I can say, oh yeah, I guess what I sort of like to direct and, and, and edit. So I did that. I became a PA. Uh, and The Big Lebowski, which it doesn't matter what I do in life, all anybody's going to ever care about is that I worked on The Big Lebowski. <laughs> I've realized that. <laughs> Neat, because it was like you were kind of, um, you were in the middle of production. You know, and when you're a production coordinator, you're kind of running the office. You're sort of like the go-to person for so many things. And it was great to, a great way to meet people. And on Payback, the guy that directed that film, a guy by the name of Brian Helgeland, he was talking to me one day. And I was doing paperwork and he said, so what does everybody in this room want to do? And everybody said something, and, and I kind of kept it quiet. And he goes, what do you want to do? I said, ah, everybody says this, but I'd love to direct one day. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, don't not tell people that. It doesn't matter if everybody says that. Don't hold that back, because someday you're going to say that to somebody, and they're going to listen. And I was like, wow, OK, well, that's, first, that's pretty cool. And Brian Helgeland taking a minute to talk to me and give me that kind of advice. Anyway, but I cut a movie called Haunting in Connecticut, and we had had a really, really great screening. Um, and, and scored pretty high, and it was, the vibe was good. And I was with the producer in the edit suite one day, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to say it now. I'm going to, you know, because it was just the vibe was right. And I said, his name is Paul Brooks, and he's the guy that owns Gold Circle Films. And we were talking about how well the screening went. And I said, Paul, I said, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I didn't tell you that one day I would love to direct a film for you. And I could see it was like a computer is sort of kind of getting hung up or something. It was like, yeah, it was like a something. It was a misfire in his brain. It was like it never occurred to him. And he's like, he stammered for a second. He goes, oh, well, um, oh, OK. Well, I can't. i got to be able to sell you. And then he said, well, I guess I could sell you. You're an editor. Mm, let me think about it. Anyway, I said, no, nah, oh, well, now I can sleep. I said it out loud to the guy who is the guy, the, the guy that um, has the money. <coughs> and then um, last year at this time, I was editing a film called The Apparition with, with Ashley Green, which is not yet. Um, and um, I got a call from Gold Circle. And they said, we're going to do Haunting in Georgia. Would you like to direct it? And I was like, blah, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's how that started. So um, that's how I got my start, and that's how where I am right now. We'll see if the movie's any good. Hopefully, it <laughs> that's the next test. Can I ask one follow-up question? What was Lebowski like? Yeah. <laughs> more on. Uh, I think it's important to think about things not so much like a dream where people say, yeah, I dream of being a cinematographer, I dream of being a director or an actor. I think the concept of dream uh, relies on something that means that you, you can't achieve it, because it's uh, simply on an unconscious level. So I never really thought, like, I dream of being a cinematographer. I just went through the actual process of becoming one. And then slowly, as Janusz became a cinematographer, uh, I became his gaffer, which is, you know, the person in charge of lighting. And then we were um, out of a film that we did for Diane Keaton. Uh, Janusz uh, was the director of photography on a film for Diane Keaton. It was on cable uh, for a Lifetime. And Steven Spielberg saw it, uh, this, this uh, Lifetime little short film, and was enamored by the photography, by the cinematography, and called Janusz in uh, for a meeting. And at that point, we were working at a Roger Corman film, and Janusz had to go in for a meeting with Spielberg, which was, you know, really strange for us. Good. Really? So I had to finish the day at Roger Corman on this film called Killer Instinct, or something like that, uh, where Janusz would go in for this interview uh, for Steven Spielberg. And so uh, through that interview, um, Janusz was asked to do Schindler's List. And now, 
before Schindler's List, we also shot a pilot for uh, Stephen called Class of 61, which is uh, about the uh, Civil War, about the graduating class at West Point. But uh, after, so we, all of a sudden, we get this opportunity, and this is probably like after 10 years, I'd say, almost like seven years in Hollywood, we're, uh, you know, we're filming with Steven Spielberg and we're in Poland freezing uh, in front of Auschwitz, location scouting and shooting this film. And at that point, we were so excited, also because of the fact that it was black and white, um, that we didn't really have a chance to think about how overwhelming it was that we were there. Uh, I, th I think it was like 27 years old at the time, and we just, the project was so, so uh, involved and so complicated that uh, we didn't really have time to think about the situation we were in. And at that moment, you know, the year after Janusz wins the Academy Award, and I was one of his, uh, you know, I was his guest, I went with him to the Academy Awards. And so after that process, um, it became, I could get an interview as a cinematographer. I could go in and meet people, and uh, you know, actually, it, it's feasible for me to be a cinematographer because I was a gaffer on Schindler's List. So training day, and then it just kept sort of, you know, my career just kind of kept going. And uh, until eventually, James Cameron had seen a film called Tears of the Sun, uh, that he really liked the, the work in the jungle that I had filmed. So I went in for an interview with James Cameron for Avatar, and uh, he offered me the film. But this was after uh, an hour-long meeting before meeting Jim uh, with the producer explaining the whole process of the film and uh, how, uh, you know, th uh, 3D was working and how motion capture was working together. So after that hour interview, you know, Jim offered me the film, and then I, you know, uh, tortured myself with Jim Cameron in New Zealand for about a year. Uh, but it was worth it. <laughs> I think that, you know, what's, what's most important of all is that everybody has access to uh, photo uh, photography or video or, or cinema or whatever it is. I think uh, the most important thing is that everybody can practice with those tools. So I, I don't think so much about that specific tool for my trade. Whatever tool uh, is applied for the job that I would, you know, I would love to experiment with. So surely from a, from a standpoint of uh, uh, creativity, uh, I don't really judge by my tools, although I, I'm just held really uh, tightly to the photographic process, because that's how I learned. And for me, that is just, you know, uh, a much more formal approach to, uh, you know, to photography. And I think there's a little bit of sloppiness uh, that goes along with digital photography. That, it, you know, there, the tendency is not maybe to pay attention to the classic forms of lighting because of the fact that it's just ready, accessible, and whatever it is. So I'm a little bit against it for film school's sake because it becomes sort of a little bit more disposable, especially if you're trying to teach cinematography more than anything else, because as a directing student, it's great to just have access and make, have as much practice with, uh, with, with that medium as possible and be able to cut your own film, because that's what it's all about. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's great knowing that you have these digital tools. In other words, you know, if I'm trying to get a take and I'm running out of time and I have a little girl in our movie and, and, and she, I'm losing her in 10 minutes and I don't have time to stop and start, I can just roll, 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 go, go, go. It's just, it's, it's, it's pixels. And you roll and you have her do her takes over and over again and boom, 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 boom. Okay, we got one. Nobody's worried about rolling film. That's great. But at the same time, it's, it's weird because you look at some of the older films before this digital age and they didn't have these tools. And so they had to, they had to shoot the movie and light the movie meticulously and the people that did that those artists you, you look at them now and you're like oh my god how did you ever make your day how did you ever pull it off and that's it's a sad, in a way it's sort of sad seeing that go away a little bit because you can fix it post you know? it's a tool and it's a curse all at the same time I have yeah I've considered uh, teaching but uh, I'm not ready for that yet I think I need like you know 20 more years in the business uh, even just from a standpoint of what can I can offer students or my mind being ready to sit down and uh, form a curriculum and be serious about teaching because I think it's you know not something that I would just approach that I could do on the weekend it would take uh, full dedication 
And yes, I've, I've thought about it and I've visited uh, various institutions uh, this past year. Uh, since the Academy Award, I've been invited to some institutions, and it's definitely something I think about in the future. Production there, Avid, um, and Final Cut Pro. Final Cut Pro is the newer one. Um, I, I like to, Avid was designed for old school editors who had, it was designed to be a similar mindset as cutting film. I, I kind of look at them both as like, Avid is like that reliable uncle that's just kind of not, He's a little boring, but not very flashy, but he never misses like one of your sporting events. And Final Cut Pro is like really funny and goofy and really slick and fun, but he's kind of unreliable. He hardly ever shows up at your events. I mean, I like Final Cut Pro, but it's so temperamental and so like, and Avid is just like rock solid, but it's nothing flashy. Um, so knowing the two formats, I think is, is very helpful because um, for me, it made the difference between getting a job and not getting a job. Yeah. But, but yeah, I would say just continue to cut, continue to know the, uh, and, and, Try and get in, and if features are your interest, try and figure out how to get your name out there to cut somebody's feature um, who, who needs it. Because it's a great gig. They'll probably let you do it at home. Um, it's super fun. You know, I mean, building your temp track of music and sound, you know, you, you, can, you can use, it's just so much, editing is so much fun because you're, 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 you're building, you're taking all the material and putting it together, and it's just like the best puzzle ever. It's just a blast. So, I have a question. There's, you know, it, uh, there there are some ideas out there which are just um, uh, make uh, life easier of getting it made. If you if you came up with an idea of that somebody uh, figures out how to bring dinosaurs back to life and they create an island that's an amusement park and then everything goes <laughs> amuck, that's a like you're, you're going to find your life easier when you have uh, ideas as opposed to it's the story of um, Emily Bronte and her relationship. It's, uh, 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 that's a that's a tough movie to sort of go out there and, and get made. Um, I my first movie was. Um, uh, uh, a Western horror, dark comedy about cannibalism uh, on the verge of the uh, gold rush. So that was an obvious property. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. That was sort of difficult to get made. And, and then the next movie was about a bunch of guys dressed in terrific suits going through Vegas pulling off a crime. That was a lot easier. Um, so there are things that, uh, not saying go and do the one that's right down the middle, but uh, that'll sort of help your cause as opposed to trying to get started doing a cannibal western. Um, watch a lot of movies, read a lot of movies. Um, I think the, the one thing that, uh, given all our different uh, disciplines, that you, we all sort of have to know is, is story. Um, and what is, um, when he's doing a shot, how is this servicing the story? When I'm writing this, am I going off Am I serving the story? Am I <coughs> writing a speech because I want to be Patty Chayefsky? Um, uh, that's an interesting question, but I think every day still approaching a new project, for me, uh, I approach it with the same innocence that I approached uh, approach it to begin with. Uh, in other words, uh, a new film starts, and for me, the cinematography hasn't been laid out, and I have no idea how it's going to look. And that's, that's what's great about it, it's that the world is open and the innocence of just the, the first, there are no images created for this film. And that's what I'm still uh, uh, really enthusiastic about. The best movies, um, to answer the first part, I think the best movies are the ones where all that stuff, all the, the, the craftsmanship, if you will, is sort of invisible. Um, and you're so caught up in the story um, that it's all this cohesive thing. So, so, I mean, in his case, obviously, it can obviously blatantly look absolutely beautifully, stunningly, you know, wonderful. In my case, I don't know if people very often say, you know, the editing was quite good in that film. <laughs> there were good choices there during that conversation. And, I mean, maybe they do, I don't know. But, but I think the best part of that is when it's invisible. Um, and, and just the whole thing comes together as one cohesive piece. So uh, I think it's important to really, you know, base all your cinematography or the photography of the film uh, on that story, if it makes sense to do something. I mean, there are some films that are all about the, you know, the spectacular cinematography, and that is part of the story. How are you enjoying the festival? Excellent. Great. I'm sorry. I I said, how are you enjoying the festival? I don't care for it. We'll try harder. 
Uh, it's, it's a great festival when you look up and you go, there they are, the people who run it. They, one, two, three, and four in a row. And they all line up like the guys at the gas station. <laughs> There's a problem, yeah. <clears throat> so, but, um, you, you see, um, so, <clears throat> so, yeah, move to L.A. You have to, I'm sorry. I, I know you, you love your families, but it's, it's time to... It, it's time to go right and make millions of dollars and have wonderful visions of yourself appear on screen. If you wish. We're out there. We're waiting for you. Why try to rewrite the book on how it's done when the odds are already so overwhelmingly stacked? It's, you know, it, it's already tough. It's like, I can't get my car out of this ditch. There's ice. Well, why don't we throw some more water down there? No. Less water. Make it easy on yourself. Come to Los Angeles. Pretty difficult. I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't bother making a low budget action film. I'd stick with like, you know, a really good story. A simple story, maybe uh, a dramatic film. Those kind of effects, which would literally have terrified someone to suicide in the 1930s, if you'd shown it, they would have jumped out a window with the intensity of it. And yet you're, you're like, you're unmoved because these days it doesn't do it unless there's a story attached that really just completely grabs you. Um, so thrillers, to me, more than action films, that you can realize for a low budget, that you can achieve. You can achieve a sense of brooding menace of dread and maybe have one action scene in it. but. The idea of trying to just do guys running around in the woods with guns for a low budget, yeah, I think it's a terrible idea. You have to, whatever it is uh, that you want to do, you have to really, don't take it lightly. It's sort of like, you know, why, why, why should it be you over somebody else? So the amount of work I feel like that you put into something, research or, you know, education, or what is that, that thing that you, that you have to offer? However much work you put into something uh, is really, in the end, what's gonna what's gonna help your situation. Not completely, like you know, let you uh, be involved in the situation, but it, it's gonna increase the opportunity. So, uh, you know, whether it's like acting or directing or writing, uh, it, it better be pretty well founded because uh, I think, uh, you know, Hollywood in a lot of ways, there's not really. Once you get there, you really have to kind of like set yourself up and do whatever it is that you're doing. There's really not much time to, to, to float around and go to the, uh, go to the parties, uh, sort of say. What is it that you want and how bad? I, I had an acting coach who would come in and say, okay, I want anybody who, who hasn't, you know, just lived, breathed, eaten this stuff for the last 10 years of your life because you can't be anywhere else because this is all you can do, because you're burning to do it, you have no choice. So I want those people to stay, everyone else leave, because if you're not burning to be here, if you haven't taken this on as though a, a birthright has been presented to you, and with a degree of obsession and intensity that suggests that you found a lifelong calling, if this isn't what you want to do in the soul of your souls, and you can't, you'd do it for free if you had to, then get the hell out of my class. I thought he was a little extreme, but, uh, I, at the same time, <clears throat> that's it, that's the gut check. I mean, are you going to Hollywood to, to pal around? You wanna have some fun? You wanna go to a party? Do you wanna make a film maybe so you can uh, call back home and tell them? Or do you wanna go there because there's no other choice for you? This is simply something that from the time you were young, in the midst of all the other people here preparing and doing their lives, you had a different notion. You had a calling beyond this place and this time to go and be in film and do those stories. If that's your passion level, then pursue it. And if it's not, if it's really just a hobby for you, think about staying and living it vicariously through the movies and not, not actually putting it on the line because there's a lot of people uh, trying to get in and some of them are downright uh, possessed with the notion. Form a writer's group, join a writer's group if there's one nearby. Uh, don't be alone. This is such a solitary, awful process, writing film, especially in Omaha where there's not even a sense that you're part of the thriving Hollywood community. Can you, I mean, you, you're alone in your attic at night typing words that to the best of your, they, the person who reads them may be your mother and that's that. That might be all. And that kind of commitment is, is very lonely. So don't be alone. Get people around you with a like-minded sense. Get people who want to make movies and write movies and swap pages back and forth. Read each other's work, comment. Get excited together because if you succeed, 
you can help someone. And even if you're failing, it's so much better to have someone, I mean, it's, it's bad, but to have someone in the sinking boat drowning with you, it's, you know, it's better. I mean, this is terrible. Yes, I know, I'm here too. It's bad. And it's much more comforting. So don't be alone. Be part of a group. Form a group, join a group. So there's really no shame in, uh, you know, in those entry-level positions, I think. No, no. In, in fact, even as... as uh, even as I get into a position where I, I'm on, on set or even on set as a director, I still run to get stuff. I don't sit in my chair and like, ask people to do it. If we're running out of time, I run and I get it myself. It's, you know, it's once again, it's not about achieving the trappings of or the respect of this, but it's about genuinely making films. And if that means, as he says, you know, subbing for people or, or uh, interning for people, whatever it takes to get you to your goal, you know, the, it's a process, it's not a destination, and the process includes um, many, many ups and downs. And even after you're successful, it will continue to include many, many ups and downs. So don't be ashamed of whatever it takes to get you there, except for like, you know, uh, sex, and, <laughs> right? That's a problem. And even then, I think it's, it's still just okay. It, it, you know, there's always the perfection, and that's, that's the thing, seeking more, writing over. Writing is rewriting, not thinking you're you're, you're popping gems out of the box, you know, every time, like Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Man, to be in your, I, there are days when to be where you are, sitting where you are right now, even without the credits, even though you want to be up here, to be where you are with the young and the, and the hunger that you have, I'd cut off my hand. We're the same because we're all pursuing the same thing. Everyone talks about someday I'm going to write a book. Do they do it? It's easy to talk about. Usually they don't do it. People who sit down and write a screenplay, who try, those are the people that I respect. Whether you finish, it, finish your screenplay, good, bad, you try to screenplay. I respect that. We're all looking for the same thing. We're looking for the shapes that we can create that mean something, that, uh, that assemble the kinds of stews around us that we're confused by into a semblance of order that we can then present and make sense of and that we, that we believe in. And my God, just, we're all in this together. I'm not teaching you any more than you're teaching me. You know, and so we all got to love each other. You know, we're all in it together. I just as soon be sitting where you're sitting, and many of you will be sitting where I'm sitting in Omaha waiting for lunch um, <laughs> very shortly now. So, you know, it's about putting yourself in, in I think my, the, the action films I tend to do, it's about putting yourself in the shoes of a real professional. It's about putting yourself in the shoes of someone who knows how to do this shit better than you do. And thinking for a minute, what would I do if I were this guy's position? What Liam Neeson in Taken is better than we are. He's a professional. And there's an inherent love, I think, of watching a professional be professional. And it could be the greatest locksmith in the world. When everyone else has failed, and he goes, just a second, and he, put, and he does this clever thing, you go, wow, boy, that guy's good, you know? There's that sense, watching a professional be professional. And for some reason, that translates best in action movies, in thrillers. You watch these guys go up against danger and odds, and you watch them execute with skills and skill sets that maybe don't belong to you, but you get to see the sense of real professionalism and decision-making, the dilemma you'd possess if you were that professional. You know, they're, they're confronted in action movies with the sorts of decisions that you don't get necessarily in a drama. They're usually life or death. And uh, so if you like high stakes, life or death, professionalism, those are the sorts of, sorts of things that are just sort of part and parcel of the action movie vocabulary, I think. And that's one of the reasons I like them anyway. What do you think of 3D? Uh, I, I, think, I think 3D is kind of interesting because it just offers a whole new, you know, experience for people. One of the things that's great about it is it's brought people back to the theater again, uh, which is kind of, you know, it's interesting. It's not in your, your living room, you're seeing things. And the theater is a great place. It's always been a, it's, it's the, the best place to see a film. And uh, so I just look at it as uh, just, another, just another tool or another way to make a movie that certain films lend themselves to, but sometimes they're forced. Uh, I didn't understand, done. especially when they do it after the fact, um, like the Green Hornet 3D, I don't understand why you have to do the Green Hornet 3D, I just, uh, yeah, writing's awful. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and it's, you know, every day you're, you're faced with another way to fuck it up. Every day is, is another chance to fail at the thing you've been paid to do, you know? Because the page is always just as white, just as blank as it was the day before. And if an idea is there, it's great, but try to think of an idea, like just sitting right now, here I go. <laughs> think, here comes the idea, big hit. <laughs> Big hit movie. Here we go. And pretty soon you just feel the chair and you, you know, you look at the people around and you're just not, not in, you're in your head and you can't get out of it. To this land of uh, ideas that just sort of naturally happens when you're not expecting it to happen. You have to trick yourself into thinking up ideas because if you sit and you concentrate, it doesn't work. You know, it's like, uh, it's like being, uh, mentally constipated and you, and you just wait for it to come day after day and you run for the it's like and you know there are days when the ideas are crowning when they're you know you have to run to get there and there are days when they're just wedged up in your gut if uh, if it if that's supposed to be an objective viewpoint for instance like a documentary an objective viewpoint is a shaky camera uh, it just, it isn't that way. I, I think like the human eye is one of the most uh, stable things and it, it pays, you know, it can change a uh, specific color temperature of each room. As you walk through a room, this room is white. The next room I walk in is, uh, is white as well and my eyes have adjusted that color. I go outside and that, that light is white. And so as I walk through, my eyes also make everything steadier and they're the most incredible steady cam they're like gyroscopes yeah and you i'm not so, aware normally except when i'm running on a track from, you know of of the horizon doing this i'm usually just aware of a very steady view so that i mean it's pretty interesting if you want people to to feel like they're part of it i think it has to be you know it's it's a complete you know the human eye is more capable the objective viewpoint seems to be much more stable i don't know i think the one thing I would suggest that he reminded me of is um, I do keep a box under the bed at all times. Um, and in it are all these toys. No, in, in it are... <laughs> <coughs> there are pieces of paper, and whenever I have an idea for a line of dialogue or a bit or this or that or anything, write it down, throw it in the box. You know, after six months, take the box out and dump it and look at all these pieces and, you know, uh, Half the you don't even remember how, how you wrote half of it. Like, Sparrows in the fire, monkey tits. You know. <laughs> I, okay, you know, but you'll see ideas that you forgot you had. That then you'll start to assemble and say, "What is this leading?" It seems like over the six months period, I've, every idea I've thrown in this box is it sort of attains a vague shape. Now look, you look at the whole of it in retrospect. You know. Care. It's not what's available. Let's, uh, Lethal Weapon 3, when it went wrong, they said, there's a building in Florida, they're gonna blow it up and they say we could be there. I said, okay, I guess that's the movie then. And it's storytelling at its finest. Let's go sit where the building is. You know, later there's gonna be some kids who get hit by a truck. Come on! It's the process. <coughs> yes, absolutely, here's a good tip. Make every day the same. <clears throat> when you're gonna write, I, I can't say you can't do it, but it's a little more difficult if you're gonna grab an hour here or, snatch 30 minutes here between appointments and much better if you can lock into a block of time that's assigned to nothing else but doing the task at hand to doing that and if you're, you get a, a schedule if you get up in the morning you smoke your cigarette you type three pages go over last night's notes feed the cat you know go for a jog around the block come back look at the notes okay transcribe two on the computer now go through and correct them okay start writing original stuff at 12 at one one go to lunch three to five, continue the original stuff, then put it in rough form here to be checked later. That night, check one page of it, leave the other page for the morning, smoke your cigarette, go to bed in the morning, you get up, do the same exact thing all over again at the same sequence with the same time intervals, and I think you'll find that you develop a series of a momentum doing the same thing every day and following a set pattern. And ideas start to come easier because your brain knows that it's not gonna be interrupted. It's not going, oh, should I think now or should I not think? Wait, are we going out? Are we gonna stay here? What are we gonna do? It just, oh, okay, I can think. And it just lets ideas start to come. Another thing that's interesting and, and useful, I think, for process is because it's so hard to think of ideas, often what I'll do is I will pick a spot that's about a mile or two away from my house, like say the 7-Eleven in my case, and I'll say, all right, look, I don't have an idea now, but I'm gonna go for a walk. I'm just gonna breathe the air, go for a walk, and uh, by the time I get there, I'll have an idea. I'm not gonna say when along the way it's gonna happen, but sometime between now and there, in that two mile distance, I will have had an idea, and usually it comes. 
when I just start walking. Um, yeah, don't stay still. And remember to breathe. I find that when I'm not working well, I'm taking little sips of breath, I find. I don't, I don't breathe deeply enough. And I think that's one of the reasons I worked well while I was smoking, when I smoked, because at least I was breathing deeply, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Good advice for the kids. <laughs> you can be weird, you can go to, yeah, I take antidepressants, I'm crazy. You can be as crazy or as weird as you want. That's my message. Don't think that because we look cool up here that we really are. The diplomacy, the, the main mistake I see people, young people making when they go to Hollywood to, uh, to try to sell their script is they mistake uh, belligerence for, what's the word? They want to be persistent and they end up being annoying, you know? To, to know what persistent is without, and to, to be able to push and know when you're not gonna get your way. Like he can be persistent all he wants on that 20 second scene. But after a point, the director is just gonna say, you know what, get him off the set, you know. Um, so if you come out, I mean, there's a way, I, I wish there was a class in it almost. I don't know if I can teach the class, but it would be how to go out and be graceful and charming and nice to people who have something you really want and not appear to be too belligerent, needy, or a pest. You know, because they say in these self-help books, never give up, so cut to, stop following me. You know, there's the mistake. No, no, that's not what they meant, you know. It's not, you know, be in his room when he opens the door with the... Um, so, yeah, there's, there's just a wonderful sense of, of coming to Hollywood with, with the graciousness and the sense of gratitude. Um, that follows from having an opportunity and a desire and not the entitlement that attends so many people. It's, 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 I see so many kids and they're, they're like, what will I do if they try to steal my idea? Oh, I'm like, oh. kid, if they, <laughs> if they, I sincerely doubt they're gonna steal your idea. What is the wasp man strike? No, they're not gonna steal your idea. Um, Can I use that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you got Iron Man 3, that's a couple of years, you can't get to that in a while. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I have some thoughts about it. You know, I'm make jokes about it. This is, this is like cover, legal cover for later when we make Wasp Man. Say, no, I joked about it. <laughs> you said yes, man. I mean, we were laughing. If, if there's a, a, a thing I love about language, it's just Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is just full of words, you know? And yes, image is important, always. But get the language right. So many directors, they just they throw out the joke. They get it wrong. They put it in the wrong order. There's a line in Lethal Weapon where Danny Glover's character says, uh, he's supposed to say, yeah, all dressed up and no one to blow instead of nowhere to go. So, of course, the director, he goes, yeah, all dressed up and no, no, nobody to, to blow. And that's the line reading they left in the movie. Makes no sense. <laughs> so they had to cut to the back of Danny's head and put the line back in the way it should be. And if you look at a movie, the gauge of whether it's directed well, often is how many backs of heads you see. Because it's always, that's the guy that we saw on the train. You know, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> or someone picks up a crucifix, and then you hear, a cross. <laughs> choice. So it's, you want to put your character in situations where they do a surprising action that reveals character, and that's just what that is. Uh, anyway, have you ever seen a trailer for a movie, and you say, well, that's gonna be a great movie, man, look at that. And then you go to actually see it when it comes out, and it's terrible. And I think the reason is that when you see it in a trailer, it evokes in you a shape that already exists out there of the perfect version of that movie that has the stew of shots you're seeing. You already sort of fill it in. It's sensed, but not quite seen fully. But the version you fill in in your head look, it promises to be great because you've already had this suggested to you as this sort of balloon. Uh, and then you see the movie and the shape they came up with didn't make it. It was actually inferior to the one generated in your head when you thought of the perfect version, the ideal platonic version of that. So the trick is to get to that shape, the one that the trailer suggests, and then fulfill the trailer. Find that shape. To me, one of the things I do, I like to do when I start to write a script is I do the trailer in my head to get the shape of it. You know, what do I, if I wanted to write a concept, I can think of the physical concept in words, or I can sit down and think, how would this trailer play? How would the preview look? And what would it evoke in me? And then how could I realize the best, most palpable version of that? Done.
So I would urge you not, you know, different people do it different ways. I can't get more than 30 pages without going back and fixing the 30. I'll write, I'll just blaze away to page 30, but I can't blaze away for 120 because I will go so far off that that tangent will waste 70 pages of time. Um, so definitely I, I, I think outlining is essential, but you can also just jump in and then start outlining once you've got a sense of the shape. I, I think sit down and write from nothing sometimes. I sometimes I don't have a concept. And at the end of the day, I say, well, I have a scene that fits in a movie that I don't know what it is. That's okay, too, because writing 52 scenes in the course of a year, you know, get maybe seven great scenes out of that, and the rest are shit. But it doesn't matter, because you're writing every day. It gets easier that way. Do I write every day? No. Oh. <laughs> Include it in the unraveling of, of story. To have little bits of backstory be revealed in ways that don't look intentional. So you don't have, well, good thing, uh, I met up with you in Vienna after that thing that happened last month. Yeah, it's not every day the president asked one of his specific aides to fly out here to get rescue a young kid from the clutches of some, you know, if you're doing that kind of dialogue, you're, you're, you know. But you find ways to get it across, and that's part of the art of it is, and you see it even in the best writers and the most advanced novelists, they use backstory dialogue that's just, oh, come on, that's painful. They would have already talked about this. Why are they saying it now? <clears throat> I think there's a, uh, the example that's, I can't remember who points to it, but there's a Clint Eastwood line in some movie where uh, he has to see a shrink and the shrink says, uh, what was your childhood like? And he says, short. And it's basically you get uh, all his backstory from that. Um, there's another better, oh, I was thinking about the professionals, as I often do just before bed. Um, where somebody's pointing to an old photograph of Lee Marvin uh, when he was with uh, the Mexican revolutionaries and he says, you're uh, your hair was darker then, and uh, Lee Marvin says, my heart was lighter then. And you kind of get a sense of that without having to cut to him with uh, Zapata. Right. Um, I never, never cut to Zapata. I'm <coughs> sure he'll be overwhelmed. Um, and I got out there and I had this idea in my head of what Hollywood is. And I, I bet a lot of us in this room have that same impression. You, you picture offices with, with, with executives sitting and they're waiting for you to show up with something cool that you did, and they're going to say, you know, I like you. You're going to make the next Steven Spielberg produced film. And that does happen. Um, and that's what you read about. But that happens once every like five years where some story like that emerges, or every two years. The rest of them are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people coming out there with different short films and what have you to show, and, or they put them in festivals. Um, and I realized quickly what I was up against when I started trying to get my little commercials in front of people. It was very depressing. And people were kind and polite, and I would show them some of my other pizza videos, thinking, you know, yeah, the, the, you know, the employees of Godfathers liked them. Look at how entertaining they are, you know? <laughs> but you realize really fast the magnitude of the competition that you're up against. And what I realized then was, you know, it, did, it only took me a couple of weeks of that soul-crushing experience. I realized, you know, maybe I will try to get into the film business because I really did want to be in the industry. I love the, the, the energy of the industry, and there are so many, it gets a bad rap because guys like Charlie Sheen and, you know, <laughs> I know, it's like, oh, Charlie, you're making everybody look bad. Because really, that behavior is not common. Most people that work in Hollywood, I found, that, that run through the day-to-day -day business and make the movies are just like us. They just are very hardworking, working, pla working class people with families, and they're just trying to pay their bills, and they all, Nobody in LA is from there hardly, they're all from somewhere else. So they're all people from like the Midwest, I mean I can't say how many you know, people I've met from Missouri and Minnesota, and Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin. And um, so um, what I realized is what if I just get into the business as an employee and start there? And um, a mentor of mine kind of when I was younger kind of said that, he goes, you know, why don't you, start, why don't you work this thing backwards? Let people, you already got your talent, you feel good about your talent. And I sort of, you know, we all have to feel good about our talent or we won't do anything with it. So I thought, yeah, I, okay, I think I have some abilities. He said, why don't you get in there and meet people first? Forget your stupid pizza reel. It's, it's not gonna get you anywhere. Go in and meet people. And so I said, okay. Um, I left Godfather's Pizza and I went to Santa Fe to work on this movie for Ron Howard called The Missing. And, um, and luckily my friends, and this is, here we go again, the friends you make, the contacts you make, how they can come back years later and help you. And I can't state that enough about meeting people and, and making contacts and keeping in contact with people, being a polite, what I was told is being a polite pain in the ass. 
you know, just always, always just, hey, how's it going? Keeping in touch. Hi, hi, hi. Because what will happen is, <coughs> if that's the path you take, meeting people, is that you've got all these people doing it, and over time, those people will start to fall away. And if you're still doing it, you rise up, rise up, rise up, and pretty soon it's just you. And I did that with a couple different people. Um, not just because I was like wanting, wanting something from them, but, but I enjoyed sort of talking to them and collaborating, and they would give me advice. So anyway, I went to Santa Fe. When I was working on Payback, going back to 1998, and a guy by the name of Brian Helgeland was directing that movie. He won the Oscar for writing L.A. Confidential, I believe. Um, and he was directing Payback. And one day he was sitting in the office, in our little production office, and he was just you know, having a cup of coffee, and he would ask people, so what's everybody want to do? And I was like, you know, people answered, and I said, oh, I'm not, you know, you've heard this a million times, but what I'd really like to do is direct. And kind of, you know, made fun of myself a little bit. And he said, no, no, no. He said, don't not tell people that. Tell everybody that. Shout it from mountaintops. Because, yes, a lot of people are going to say, oh, God, that guy, okay. But one day, somebody will listen to you by virtue of knowing you or by virtue of something that you did creatively, in my case, maybe editing. And they'll say, oh, okay, that tracks. So flash forward now to this moment on New Daughter, where I was doing the cut with Gold Circle. It was my third film with them. And again, had a particularly good showing with a couple scenes, and Paul, the producer, was very excited. And I thought, this is my moment that Brian told me about, whatever, 10 years ago. I'm going to take it right now. And I said, Paul, I said, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I didn't tell you that I would love to direct a film for you one day. And it's like I was saying yesterday, it's like, a, like it's almost like the, 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 his computer screen flickered. Like I can see this, this hard drive seize up a little bit. It was like, <laughs> it's like it didn't compute. And he said, well, oh, oh, okay, well, it never had occurred to him. And he said, okay, well, well, all right, I'll remember that, or you know, we'll see. I mean, get me a reel. I can't remember what he said, and I had no reel at the time. Pizza commercials, that worked out well for me. I mean, it did work out well for me in terms of a career. It was awesome. I'm so thankful for it. But in terms of Hollywood, it, was, it did nothing. So anyway, um, so we, what we found, as, when I was a production coordinator, we also always had to hire PAs. And what we found was the PAs that came in from, like, people like in this room, who came from other parts of the country or just came from, they just wanted to get into the business. Those production assistants would work their tails off, work so hard. The film school students, a lot of those guys would come in, guys and gals, and they had this sort of sense of entitlement a little bit. And I'm generalizing, because they're not all like that. But we had bad luck with film students, because they had gone through this a, a wonderful experience in film school of making these films. And by the way, if they make a film, and it gets in a festival, and somebody recognizes them, which is what happens sometimes. So what happened to Brett Ratner with Steven Spielberg. You know, all bets are off. Film school, excellent, good job. And that happens, and that's important. But the ones that, for whatever reason, they don't make a movie that, does, that, that resonates like that, or doesn't get the exposure, or it's just not, maybe not good enough, or it doesn't have the right thing, or the right person doesn't see it at the right time, those people have to go make a living. And if they want to be in the film business, they're going to start off as a PA. You have to be able to, you got to be willing to go in there and have confidence in yourself Belief in yourself enough to know that I'm doing this right now. I know it's soul crushing, but at the end of this is something wonderful. And guess what? There are all kinds of studio executives, studio heads, and extreme, extremely successful people in the film business that started off as PAs. And the thing when you're working in Hollywood and you're going to a restaurant to have dinner, what's amazing about that environment is that the guy busting your table tomorrow could sell a script and suddenly you're working for him. I mean, that's how fast it happens. A guy could be laboring over a script, guy or gal, months and months and months, you know, and he's trying to get it sold, trying to get it sold, and he's working as, your, as the busboy, and he gets a phone call, and it's like, hey, you know, we're interested in your script. You know, why don't you come on in for a meeting? And boom, it's that fast. And I'm not even exaggerating. Um, now, that happens very rarely to people, but it happens, yet it happens all the time in sort of Hollywood, in the Hollywood way. So that's kind of the neat thing. It's like, you know, you go there, and it's like, be nice to the busboy, you might be working for him about, in about 12 hours. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, so that's, that's the sort of long answer to the film school question. I totally, totally um, advocate it. You have to, or college, because, you know, boy, I mean, when, well, let me tell you, when, that, when, I, when I wasn't getting editing gigs after White Noise 2 and I stopped getting editing gigs and my agency kind of just let me go, I thought, ooh, wouldn't it be nice right now? <clears throat> to have that degree in something where I could say, you know what, screw you guys, I can do this. I didn't have that feeling. I was like, I gotta believe in myself, I gotta believe in myself, I gotta believe in myself. And <clears throat> ultimately, so far, that, that paid off. Um, you know, I was very, I, I, I am invigorated by people's notes. Some people hate them. 
And sometimes they're hard. You get a note from somebody, you're like, oh, really? I mean, you, know, you want scary whispering in this scene? That's going to totally cheese it up. No. <laughs> but then you do it. And what you thought was stupid, the audience tells you in the focus group after they've seen the movie, we like the scene where they're, like, like they're sure in the woods and there's whispering noises. And I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, that's real. I agreed at the time. <laughs> that's what I said. Uh, so, so honing your talent, a lot of honing your talent is being willing to, to, to listen to others. And, and let them, and because and, you will be this, you'll be pleasantly surprised many times by what what somebody tells you, what, a note they give you, a suggestion, how you can take that and make it cool. I, I, I've learned that it's really good to know. You don't need to know everything down the road, but it's good to know what your ending is, uh, kind of before you uh, start. You definitely, uh, I would say, you definitely need to know. Uh, I always need to know my page what I call page 30 moment is, and now they're on a mission to do this. Or uh, here's the thing where the movie launches. Uh, Die Hard, it's when the terrorists take over and John McClane's upstairs without his shoes on, and it's like, okay, now, that, now this is the movie. Um, I think there's some, I think I read once the Coen brothers just sort of write it scene by scene. I, uh, there's some movies that, out there that feel like that, but it's sort of like, they're kind of, hey, let's, this is cool now. Um, uh, sort of what, whatever keeps you writing. I mean, it's all, also okay to write a 140-page uh, first draft, which is, has all sorts of mistakes, because then you can look at it and uh, sort of carve out a little bit of your structure from that. Um, I know a lot of people, especially comedy writers, who, who write long and then kind of figure it out. So. Um, I think it's great to outline. I think over planning can maybe take the life and the fun out of writing because then you're just typing. Um, but there are people who probably do that uh, very, very well. When you're, uh, in Hollywood movies, your dramatic question really isn't, is James Bond going to live? <laughs> it's how the hell is James Bond going to live? And the, answering that dramatic question uh, is what's sort of propelling you through the story. Um, so when uh, uh, there's a little bit of maybe in Ocean's Eleven of are they going to get away with it because actually in the 1960 version they don't. Um, but it's uh, but really the, the dramatic question is how are they possibly going to uh, steal 100 million dollars from a casino that has all this security. Well, here's the good news. It's not a lottery because there's, this, there's an X factor that changes everything that completely upends and redistributes the odds. It throws out those results and that's the X factor is talent. If you have talent, everything changes. You go to the top of that list. It's not 93%. Now you're one of the golden ones who is recognizably different, is uniquely skilled. Wow, talent, that's different. That means you have a shot. That means the numbers mean nothing. That means the statistics go out the window. Now here's the bad news. Most of you don't have talent. And I can say that, as, as I've said, because Anyone in the audience hearing it will automatically say, yeah, yeah he's, he's right, that guy doesn't have talent. And they always, you know, they're always going to think that they're the ones who are blessed. And you know what? That's the way to think. You have to hang on to the passionate belief that you have something uniquely suited for this craft, something to bring to the party. I, I wanted to be an actor, and I, I stopped. And you know why? Because I would go into an office to audition for a role, and there'd be like 10 other guys in the office, and they all sort of look like me. And one of them I recognize, he's done some television, or, and I'm thinking, well, he'd be good for this part, he's great, you know? And I didn't have the sense that I was the one who was uniquely suited. I thought someone else could do it better. You have to have a passionate belief, I think, that there is at least something that you do, or you bring to the party, that is unique, different, better, than anybody else who would do it. What is your abiding passion? What is the thing that drives you, that from an early age has caused you to be so intrigued by and fascinated with movies? Storytelling. Here's another question. How many of you read a lot of novels? Okay. It would, it's abundantly surprising to me. Uh, in Hollywood, and there, there's an advantage to be get, gained here. How many people come to Hollywood and they haven't really read much, and they want to be writers? They say, well, I've, I've seen some movies. You know, just, okay, but, you know, 
or someone who, who I, I've had this one girl, God, she was so annoying, who, who said, um, I said, well, you know, this, this, this is kind of flat. And she said, well, that's the way it happened. I, I, I know. And she goes, look, the truth, her big thing was the truth is your friend. The truth is not your enemy. Okay, no, no, no. The, the truth, in this case, is very dull. And dull is the enemy. You have to make it engaging. You have to, people say that guy's a liar. Why? Because he told a story and he added all these details. No, that guy's a storyteller because he embellished. I went to college and a friend of mine was writing a screenplay. I said, well, what? Wow. Screenplay, huh? How do you do What's different? He goes, well, <clears throat> interior, you're inside. Exterior, that means you've gone out. It's day or it's night. I said, what else? He goes, that's it. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, and to experiment. And these guys who know all the answers, like Sid Fields, I would be wary of. I'll tell you why, because it's easy to deconstruct. If you see something after the fact, and you start tearing it apart, and say, well, it works because in the, the character obviously reveals their essence here, but their substance is withheld until this point. Well, I can do that too afterwards, but try, wh where's the last, you know, Sid Fields movie that made a lot of money? Where's the last, you know, big hit blockbuster from uh, that Robert McKee guy? Where are his scripts? He doesn't write them, he just tears them apart. Easy to do it backwards. You know, you ever have one of those maze games where you, you know, find the magic treasure and you have to go in? Start at the end, it's easy. It's only going through the maze from the beginning that's hard. Um, what I came to realize as I entered the field through theater, everything's a thriller. Think about it. Love story, at the end, what happens? They don't match up. He's headed for the airport, he's gonna fly back to America. She realizes, oh no, I love him. She's rushing to get to the airport. Will she get there in time? Suspense, right? What's gonna happen next? Same thing, uh, character goes through it muddled. They're, 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 throughout the entire movie, they're just, they're not, they're not getting it. They're in their own denial. Are they gonna burst free? Are they gonna have an epiphany and emerge from the sort of darkness in which they're immersed? Or are they gonna continue just not to get it? When are the lights gonna come on? It's almost the end of the movie. They look like they're about to have realization. Are they gonna realize it or not? Are they gonna come through mentally or not? Suspense. You wanna see what happens next. Very important. The other lesson I learned coming into Hollywood, they'll give you 10 pages. After 10 pages, they're gonna stop reading your script. Because that by then they're either, they're either hooked and they'll think, okay, this is worth continuing. Or by that point, they're just gonna say, yeah, he's, he hasn't got me yet and I've got seven other scripts to read this weekend. Because they ju you just have to get them quick. You get a window of about 30 seconds, you know, in the big picture to just score with these people. So if your screenplays in the first 10 pages don't offer compelling evidence to someone to continue, if they don't hook someone, hook the viewer, hook the reader, and pull them into your story, you're not gonna get across because they won't give you 20 pages. They won't give you 30 pages. They'll just give you 10. And I sort of, I hate to say it, I sort of agree. If you can't give me a scene that's compelling that hooks me by page 10 and makes me wanna read page 11 to see what happens next, then that's probably an inherent problem with your screenplay, right? So no matter how, the, the illusion is if you write 10 scripts, let's say I write, I've written about 10 scripts, then the 11th one's gonna be easy, right? Because you've done it 10 times, it should be easy by now. I don't know how to tell you this, but it's just, uh, the 11th one is harder. Every one is harder than the one before. I don't know why that is, it just never gets easier. Writing is thankless, it's usually accomplished in an attic at home, you know, scribbling on notepads, the outcome of which will be viewed most likely by your mother and that's that, you know. Where are you gonna, who's gonna read this? It's just lonely, which is why I always recommend that if you're starting out, you get in a writer's group, or you form a writer's group, so you're surrounded by like-minded people who you can switch each other's pages back and forth and assess each other's work and just basically form a very uh, viable creative environment in which to share ideas. And, you know, and don't, don't worry about, you know, I used to have people say, well, what if someone sues me? I'll show him my pages and then he'll take those pages or he'll sue me over my, don't sue anybody first off, just don't do it, you know? No one's gonna take your damn idea. It's just not gonna happen. 
I had a guy call me from, oddly enough, Nebraska <laughs> in Hollywood when I had my number listed. And he said, yo, I, I have an idea for a screenplay. I really, it's a great story. It's a great story. And I, I want you to write it with me. I said, okay, yeah. Uh, I don't really do that, sir. I mean, I said, he said, well, I, but it's great. I said, well, can I tell you, I, if I told you the idea, you'd, you'd love it. I said, well, wow. look, I can't, what's the idea? He goes, well, I can't tell you the idea. I said, why not? Well, how do I know you're not just going to take it? I said, okay, sir, first off, thanks for calling. Secondly, you know, put it in your ass, okay? Because the idea that, I mean, I'm not dry. I have ideas. I don't need some guy calling me saying, I have an idea and I'll share half of it with you, but I can't really tell you what it is because it's so good, you'll take it. No one's gonna take it. To be, he could win the Academy Award. I don't care. I'm not gonna steal your idea. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you write a script and you like it, great, but there's more where that came from. If someone says, replace a scene, replace it. Nothing's too precious. Don't be married to your work, you know? Because writing is rewriting, I think. And I'll get all excited about a draft and I'll finish it and someone points something out and go, oh boy, I gotta lose 30 pages. And you just have to lose those 30 pages sometimes. And the good news is they don't really go away. They sit on your computer and you can use them later for something else. I will actually talk to you afterwards. What I won't do is unfortunately accept manuscripts because I can't. <clears throat> My arms don't work. Uh, <laughs> it's not funny. <clears throat> Ultimately, that sort of self-destructive, arrogant behavior won't fly. The humility and the graciousness of presenting yourself confidently, but with the clear message that, look, I'm here because I want something from you, obviously, but I'm not going to press the issue. I believe in this passionately. Passion over fear every time when you're trying to say something. Oh, I've taken a razor and throw it at that chick. Um, it's about faith over fear, really. I mean. Honestly, and this will sound terrible, but studios are so unsure about what they want when they're buying a project. You can walk into to sell something with a needle in your arm and your hair sticking out, and if you say, oh, man, I have a passion for this thing, uh, there's a, something never done. Okay, imagine this, now imagine that. What if you did that? This, I just, oh, I can, I can see it, I can feel it. I know what I want, here it is, boom, boom, boom. What do you think? And as opposed to someone comes in there tentative, you know, and if you if you have a little bit of fear, they're like a horse scenting it. They know you're afraid. They know you're tentative, and they go, "Well, the guy, you know, the other guy with the needle in his arm, he, he was kind of passionate." <laughs> <laughs> and they hire this guy, and the guy says, "I'll show up for work three hours late, and I'm gonna be with some whores." And say, "Okay, you know, he has some interesting idea. He's, he's with whores, but I think it's it's good for the picture." <laughs> and, it's, it's just the faith of knowing that you want something passionately and you have a very clear idea of how to obtain the shape that you want. I was saying this yesterday that how many of you have ever seen a trailer for a movie, a preview, and you say, that looks like a great movie, I want to see that. <clears throat> and then the actual movie comes out and it's bad. And you go, well, it's such a good trailer. And I think it's because, to me, all movies, the perfect version of a movie, all movies, already exist out there in the ether. And it's a, truly a case of chipping away everything that doesn't look like the elephant until all that's left is the elephant. So that movie that was suggested to you by the images in that trailer that you sort of sense but don't quite see, it suggests a shape to you that you like. They go, wow, if they were to sort of achieve this thing that they almost just sort of formed in my head that I can almost picture, that would be great because they reminded me of this shape that's already out there, the perfect version of the movie. Then when they made the movie, they didn't catch it. They screwed it up, and the shape they suggested to you with those images, they actually went a direction that didn't capture the essence of it in the way that it could have been exploited. The image in your head was better than what they came up with. So to me, it's about figuring out when you write a movie passionately, what's this movie's shape? What's this movie's, what sort of images, what sort of music's it's not right? It doesn't matter how many bad things you see on television or how many awful movies you see. How do you make yours better than that? How do you make yours good? And the idea of judging yourself based on what is acceptable to some rather than demanding from yourself what is acceptable to you is a tremendous disconnect. And I think it's important to keep those standards very, very high. Between um, the two of them, 
if you pitch that to me and I see the glint go on, the lights come on in your eyes because I know that you're actually excited, there's nothing more contagious than excitement. I came in here right now feeling so nervous and afraid because I was so tired when I started talking. And I thought, I'm going to lose every one of them uh, because I'm just tired. And so I told a joke, and then there's like a muttered laughter. Oh, that's like a golf clap, man. I'm done. And, <laughs> and, but at some point, the light came on a little bit, and I, what it is is this kicked in, you know? <laughs> nothing really passionate. No, there's nothing special about that, you know? It's just, I, I could have just as easily hit myself with a shot of, you know, Ben's dream. Um, <laughs> But passion, you know, and it happens when you start telling a story. A friend of mine described testifying in court this way. He was so nervous. And then he started talking. And while he was talking, he felt nervous. But as soon as he started telling the story, he relaxed. Because all of a sudden, he got caught up. Well, and then this happened. And then now I did this. And he was actually comfortable telling stories because he suddenly realized, wait, I'm a writer. This is what I do. I tell stories for a living. And I feel okay with it now. It's, it's very hard, if you're not a writer, to just say, look, I don't have scripts because I don't write. I'm a director. Well, where have you, can we see your work? Not yet. <laughs> and they say, well, how do we know you're a director, right? So because the intense competition demands that <coughs> you sort of uh, rise above by virtue of your passion and your skill and your talent, you have to be able to demonstrate that, I think in some kind of a, a DVD or, or even a posting online, a website, something people can access to see quickly. Because the other thing is people don't even want to walk with this DVD to put it in something and look at it. You know, it's, it's such a tough thing to get people to watch your DVD. Uh, a reel online is pretty good because they just punch it up and they say, okay, kid knows what he's talking about. Or they say, well, I don't know, this kid looks like, you know, yeah, go either way. So, but the more story, the better. You should be able to cut story out. You should have too much to tell, is my, my feeling. I always write 100 pages to get 60, you know? I boil it down, and then I take the 60 and I make it into 50. <clears throat> and by the time it's boiled down, it's just stuffed. It's stuffed with all the aggregate of the things that I could still use from the 100 pages and the things that I didn't use, the kind of reduction that you've got after having boiled it off, I just put that in a file and save it for a future script. But having too much story is better than uh, too little, as you well know. Um, so all I can say is just try to find a way to generate, you think about your theme, think about what you're trying to say with the story, and what's, like if, if this is your melody, what's your counter melody? What's something relating to what you're writing that could actually form a, you know, a sort of really interesting baseline for it, or argue against it, or work in, in tandem with it to form a tapestry that presents the whole shape that you're looking to create on a bigger version than the one you'd originally intended that's too short. I'm sure there's a way to do that. Let's take a couple more, two more. Oh, you yeah. know, genre. It's all, it's all just storytelling. So if someone says, this is a good goddamn piece of writing, with the surprising twists and the and, and really dynamic ending where the characters really pay off. I don't care whether that's a war picture, a monster picture, a straight drama, a foreign film, anything. But you're the storyteller. Uh, don't follow the trend. Follow your passion. Follow, for lack of a better expression, your heart. And it really will pay off. I mean, it's not going to pay off to try to capitalize on what you feel are popular trends in Hollywood. They're going to change and everyone will see the pandering, they'll recognize the cynicism. You can't be cynical, you have to be as uh, open and devoted and loving toward the genre as hopefully you are to your fellow writers, because we're all in this together. We're not here to figure out new ways to make money, we're here to figure out new ways to tell stories. So thinking about trends and this and that, it's tempting, but don't do it. Think about what's important, what renders you unique, what renders your story powerful, and then write the story that you best know how to write in a way that you feel most represents your voice out there. Get it right, get your voice there, put some twist in it, and then set it sail and turn over the results, and I'm, I'm sure that you'll have some fun, and also you probably have to move to LA, because coming to it from Omaha is not gonna be the best idea.
who do what you're, do, what you're suggesting fail, and the other people are all doing it the right way. And the most people that I know laugh at trends and say, that's ridiculous. You're like, I want to do my story, you know. The way to swagger, the way to come in with a, a you know, burst of defiance and get what you want is faith over fear. Fear is, oh my God, I gotta copy somebody, you know. Faith is, this is my story. So faith over fear almost always works, you know. I believe that anyway. So uh, film school is going to cost you a minimum $20,000. We just got it for $45 this weekend. So thank you very much. <laughs>